What does it mean to simulate human consciousness? I'm talking about in a machine. I, I know you might look at it and go, oh, that's ridiculous, James. The human brain has seven trillion neurons in it with uncountably many connections between them. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. No. I understand that a brain is a fundamentally different processing method, uh, but you can crudely simulate that. You can brute force simulate that with the way that uh, silicon computers work, all right? Which means that if you have a fast enough basic computer, you can simulate a human brain. You know, neuron for neuron, eventually. It'll just take a while. Uh, maybe you won't be doing it in real time, but it's a simulation. You can run slow. Say uh, 17 seconds for one second. Now I ask, again, what does that mean? What is consciousness? Now, most people are going to collectively take the, the more crude and lazy uh, self-experienced method of consciousness where it is something that recognizes itself as a mind. Now, you got that idea. Question is, what happens when you pause the program, when you halt the program, when you slow it down, speed it up? Uh, when you start tinkering with it, when you start rewriting the fundamental way that the brain that's being simulated works. So maybe, maybe it's analogous to the way it works with biological humans. You go to sleep, you wake up, you don't really know how long it's been. Or worse, you get hit in the head and you lose consciousness, and then the next thing you know, people are trying to wake you up with, and lights are flashing in your eyes because they're taking you to a hospital. Or you're a coma patient. Boom, you wake up. Years have passed, and the only reason you know any time has passed is because when you get up, your body state, which did not turn off, uh, is different. You, you can tell that you've wasted away and you're tired and you've got bed sores and you've probably soiled yourself and you name it. But if that doesn't happen, if not only your mind but your body is getting paused or rearranged or scrambled or reset or whatever, what about if, if the entire world around you is getting paused, turned off, rearranged, copied from one place to another? How would you, the conscious person, experiencing that, know? How do you know that uh, reality is continuously flowing? You kind of don't. You have your own experiential frame. Uh, so if, if you right now were a simulation and God outside the universe was tinkering with the, the bitrate, speeding up, slowing down, that would be relative to him. You would not know. Now, why am I talking about this? Uh, it's because these are a lot of the ideas in Permutation City by Greg Egan, which puts new meaning to the phrase hard science fiction, in my opinion. This is like the platonic ideal of what it means to say that a story is hard science fiction, where it is the science first. Now, is what he presents in this story technically possible? Probably not. And that, that, I guess that would make some people say, oh, therefore it's soft sci-fi. Uh, but this story entirely hinges on the speculation of the ideas. It is entirely exploring the idea of what does it mean to simulate consciousness? Is it still consciousness? Is there a fundamental difference? Uh, what will that entail? What will life be like for people that are able to edit themselves? Maybe they're anxious about the fact that they were turned into a simulacra. But can't they just edit out their anxiety? Why not? Once you start messing with the brain, where do you stop? There, there really isn't a reason to stop at any point. Why not put yourself in an eternal state of satiety and happiness? Now, one of the conceits of the story, uh, which I do want to touch on because this is sort of a recommendation. And I say sort of because as a story, it kind of leaves a lot to be desired. You don't really like the characters. The plotting and pacing is kind of all over the place. Uh, the second part of the book is like one third of the length and it's like a completely different genre. Um, it's weird. But it's completely carried by the fact that the way it approaches the idea of what ends, ends up being titled dust theory uh, is very interesting, at least to people like me. 
I, I found the concept of uh, what you know. What are the implications? How are people going to behave? What does it mean? Like m- maybe maybe I found it ridiculous the amount of control they had over re- rewriting their own brains. But I kind of enjoyed the idea, anyways. The idea, the ideas in the story, I had encountered a lot of other places, and arguably the other places that were more treating it more as nonfiction, if you will, may, maybe presented it a bit better. But that doesn't mean I didn't like the book. It just, you know, it, it has that stereotype of hard science fiction where it's the science first, and the characters are just there to explain the science which drives a lot of people away from that genre. And in this case, I definitely understand. But I liked it. Maybe the story could have been plotted differently because there's the a lot relies on a failure to communicate. Because part of the story in the opening is from the perspective of this programmer, Maria, uh, as she gets brought into Paul Duran's um, plan to build a sanctuary for, uh, you know, billionaire uh, copies. Copies being the term for uh, human consciousness uh, replicated in machine simulacra. Uh, and in the beginning, there's actually a rel- rel- relatively interesting craft setup, I'll call it, because it's jumping between her and Paul, who has copied himself into the machine and run is running experiments to try and prove this dust hypothesis that uh, consciousness r- maintains continuity no matter what. I admit I screwed up and didn't realize that there's a six year time gap and the copy experiments are six years prior to Maria meeting him. And that that was me being stupid. Pay attention to the dates and stories. They do actually matter. Um, at least it, when they are, you know, jumping through a number of years, I have a habit of just flat out ignoring them. That's driven by fantasy largely, where they will just pull a random year out of their asshole, and it means nothing. And when I was reading this book, I, you know, it takes place in like 2050 or something. Let's see if I can find a uh, chapter break. Yeah, 2050. And it has these speculations about weather modulation and uh, people uh, paying for processing power on these public supercomputers, um, different uh, global hegemonies have broken out. And it's like some thought was given to it, but it was just kind of to frame this story about simulated consciousness. So all that science building, that was fine. I, I liked the structure in the first half. I think the payoff up until part two was pretty satisfying. And then in part two, where they're in this, like, uh, Clark's Law level of simulation, I don't want to give... I'm going to try and filter some of the events because some of you, I think, are going to hear this review and go, man, this is right up my damn alley. And I don't want to, like, ruin the experience. But the, the logical extension of what does it mean to simulate a mind is what does it mean to simulate the world? Uh, is our world a simulation? Is, uh, c- can you conceive of Earth as a program being run by God for his purposes? Because it very clearly sets up a scientific explanation and then he tries to pull a, a magic trick of, voila, look, look, this is what, what it would be like if there were gods ruling over the world. But maybe they don't really control it because how can they control your mind? And it kind of breaks down in the science at the end because it, get, it comes into this question of um, agreed on plausibility is the nature of reality. Because if consciousness is self knowledge, uh, why does it stop? Why is there a boundary around the individual? Isn't it sort of the entire universe is recognizing itself as itself, as a co- coherent universe? Which is one of the reasonable explanations for why the laws of physics and everything are continuous through time. Um, and I imagine Greg Egan has probably had similar conversations that I've had. Uh, if he's ever spoken with a creationist. Because they get into this really dumb argument that if you've ever gotten into this argument, maybe you've had this too, where they say, the world, they, they make this claim that the world is 6,000 years old because that's how God made it. Then you point out the evidence 
that it's older than that. And I go, well, no, 6,000 years ago, God made it to look like that. Which, unfortunately, you can't actually really refute because modern science just kind of takes it as a given that the world is uh, understandable and the rules of nature are consistent through time. We have no proof of either of those things, except that it seems to play out so far. Our predictions seem to, be, to, to hold up when they're good predictions. That is the entire proof. We have no proof that the past is the way we think it is. We just have speculations that, well, if the, if the laws of nature were, are consistent, it would have to be like this in a previous, previous state. Um, so if you were to say simulate a universe uh, from a arbitrary start, but actually it could have gotten there through, through processes, you can't tell the difference. You know, when, when you're at time, you know, 7 billion, you know, year 7 billion, you can't tell the difference between it was started at time 6 billion or started at time 1 billion or whatever. And that, that problem is the entire finale uh, that they have to solve, which you know what I appreciate when a a science fiction book approaches and understands more uh, esoteric questions that are kind of in the domain of theology uh, traditionally and philosophy and so on. I think that makes for good science fiction. If you are going to agree with this proposal. Or maybe you'll read this and go, wow, this guy must like hate Christianity or something. He must be, he's clearly an atheist or something, which I, I don't know. I didn't pull up his wiki page to make this. I don't know. You might have, your mileage may vary. This is a weird book in a lot of ways. Uh, this is not a general audience recommendation. Like I would say Dracula that, you know, I reviewed two days ago. That is a general audience recommendation. I think anybody would enjoy that book. Very few people are going to enjoy Permutation City. I'm one of those people, though. And it, in a sense, I, it's actually kind of inspiring uh, as also a science fiction author. You know, I, I put out stuff. I, I make my attempts. I try to p do my best with these books to provide a good story. But in comparison to Premutation City, this is the softest, most character-driven drama plot you could imagine compared to that. So uh, if you do decide to pick it up, I hope you enjoy it. You've been warned, okay? Don't come crawling back to me saying I gave a bad recommendation or something. I, I told you straight up the kind of dry scientific nonsense. that This was cooked up in a grad student's uh, laboratory or something. You've been warned. I liked it, though. Until uh, then, please drop a like, drop a subscribe. Uh, consider picking up my book. It's so good. Come on, like, don't, don't you like Cyberpunk Detective series about uh, gangs and violence and police crackdowns over, uh, dr you know, fancy new drug distribution networks? Good stuff. Until then, though. Cheers.